So lawyers can be kind of geeky, and I've got to confess that I get geeky about big questions and big problems and paradoxes. Like, for example, I'm a huge fan of Thomas Jefferson. Thomas Jefferson was, if you'll recall, he was, he was our original, uh, uh, he authored the Declaration of Independence. He led our country through very difficult times. Um, he was a business owner. He uh, was a deeply spiritual person. He even wrote his own version of the Bible. He was wise. He was intelligent. And by all accounts, he was supremely ethical. But he had a blind spot when it came to slavery. So does this diminish his greatness? He was a great man, but I do think that tarnishes him a little bit. So I am going to invite you to join me on a little thought experiment. Think about how it is, like, think about the future 100 years from now, 200 years from now. What is it that we're doing today that our ancestors will judge us harshly for? Um, think about this idea that, I mean, I mean, we're wise and we're intelligent and we're smart, yet there are things that we're doing today that will seem primitive to our great grandchildren. So, what, when I think about that, the first thing that comes to mind, my mind is just this ungodly amount of sugar that we feed children. But, uh, but that's not what I'm here to talk about. I, I really do think that we'll be judged rather harshly about how it is that we pe treat people with, with the disease of addiction. Because science has actually known for a very long time that addiction is a disease of the brain. It interrupts an addict's ability to make good choices and make good decisions. Yet we generally expect an addict who has a brain disease to use that diseased brain to make better choices. You know, we accuse them of a lack of willpower. They don't understand the consequences of their actions. And they, where are their morals? I'm crying out loud. You know, but we have healthy brains. And what, we don't really stop to think about what is it, where is it that's even processed in the brain? Now, as a courthouse lawyer, when I think about how it is we treat addicts, I think about it through the frame of the criminal justice system. And the way we treat addicts for a long time has been lock them up. Now, uh, that's been really the dominant solution for probably 50 years. And, um, you know, it isn't really working very well. Now, fortunately, the science is uh, catching up. We have some more, our more enlightened leaders and more forward-thinking leaders are innovating and thinking of solutions, but I really think that we have a long way to go. So now, and by the way, I'm not, um, I'm not pointing the fingers at anybody. I, I'm an offender myself. I started my legal career as an assistant district attorney, and I am responsible for locking up many, many people with a disease of addiction that probably would have been better served in a therapeutic setting. But we didn't know. And, and by the way, Please do not hear me say that I think we should ignore people that break the law or that we should somehow hand out free passes. It's just we have to learn how to respond in a different and, and better way. So when I was in the courthouse, uh, I handled all the big cases that you'd see on the media, rapes, robberies, murders, the kinds of cases that give the public an impression of what's going on at the courthouse. But I'm going to tell you, the media really doesn't scratch the surface of what's really going on, and statistics do not tell an accurate story. What I'm, my message to you is this. The vast majority of all criminal cases, the underlying issue is substance abuse, alcoholism, and the disease of addiction. My personal belief is that if we could solve the puzzle that's the disease of addiction, we could cut the crime rate by over 50%. So, now today I represent moms and dads sons and daughters, people that are suffering from the disease of addiction, um, they're, they're remarkably like us. They're normal people with normal mixes of good and bad. They do tend to have a quite a bit higher incidence of childhood trauma. Um, but otherwise, they're, they're, they're good people, but they're trapped in a body and a damaged brain that's a version of themselves, but they have profoundly, profoundly damaged brains. Now, despite the fact that all, I mean, the vast majority of criminal cases um, that go before in the courthouse and the lawyers and the judges, the ones that are tasked with, you know, solving, you know, figuring out what's right to do in this case, have zero training in addiction. There's no training in law school uh, for addiction, yet we're the ones creating the, the solutions. 
Um, it would be a little bit like what if you went to a hospital to get cancer treatment and none of the doctors there know anything about cancer. Well, they, they said, well, I think you've got cancer, but I don't, never had any formal training in, in cancer. That's kind of what we're, we're facing. Now, I'm going to tell you this too. You, you can solve the criminal problem, but if you don't solve the underlying issue that got into the courthouse to begin with, it's a revolving door. They're just back again. Probation violation, a new case, one step closer to prison. So um, now, obviously, not every um, addict gets involved in the criminal justice system. I, I suspect most don't. So the problem is actually much larger than my small view, which is, which is the courthouse. Uh, last fall, the U.S. Surgeon General did his report on addiction. It was released last fall. Um, and came up with some, this is their first ever report on addiction. Well, they said there's 66 million people that involved in binge drinking in the last 30 days, and 27 million people use illicit drugs or misuse prescription drugs. That's 93 million people. Now, what is that 93 million people? What does that look like? That looks like if you were to take every man, woman, and child in the, in the states in red, that's what that looks like. Now, I'm, I'm not suggesting that these people are suffering from addiction. They're, they're dancing with addiction. They're dancing with um, flirting with very high-risk activity. But the Surgeon General says that people that, have, that can be clinically diagnosed, that, that, that fit the criteria for a substance abuse disorder, that actually suffer from a brain disease of addiction, it's 23 million people. And if you would plot it like this, that's every man, woman, and child in this area has a disease of the brain. I mean, this, is, this isn't bad water in Flint, Michigan. This is a, a problem. This is, by any accounts, it's, a, it's an epidemic. So what's going on? Before you, you can really tackle addiction, you have to understand what's going on that six inches between your ears. Um, the addiction is always, it's, it's a tension between these two areas of the brain, the prefrontal cortex, this guy right here, Prefrontal cortex, that's the cool part that makes us human. This part down a little bit lower, the nucleus accumbens, that's the midbrain. That's our more animalistic brain. There's, a, there's this tension always between the nucleus accumbens and the prefrontal cortex. Now, the prefrontal cortex, this is the area that is the thinking brain. This is, you know, like uh, apes are faster than us and they're stronger than us. But because of what this does for us, we're the dominant species on this planet. Okay? This is goal setting. This is executive function. It's determining the difference between good, better, and best. Uh, it's where suppression of urges happen. Now, this other part of the brain, this is the more animalistic part of the brain, the midbrain. This is the part that um, some people call it the lizard brain. It's not really, it's part of our subconscious. It's not really a thinking part. It's more of an instinctive part. The little nucleus accumbens, they also call it the pleasure center. And that's, that little structure there has really kept our species alive for about 200,000 years. Um, and what it would do is it, it, it helps the brain obsess over things that would keep us alive. Food, water, sex, pass the genetic material to the next generation. And when it, it does that by releasing dopamine whenever it finds something it wants and, and, and helps it focus and concentrate on that. But there are mood-altering substances that massively overstimulate this. And whenever you have a massively overstimulated nucleus accumbens, the nucleus accumbens takes over, and it literally cuts off the prefrontal cortex from making a decision. You literally cannot think about what it is. You, you know the answer. You can talk to an addict all day long. They know the answer. They just can't do it. It's because this part of the, the structure of the brain cuts it off. And we all do this. Every one of us, we have this dynamic tension between nucleus accumbens and, and the prefrontal cortex. So, you know, nucleus accumbens or prefrontal cortex will say, I'm going to lose weight. Uh, I'm going to go on a diet. But by the end of the day, you've had an ice cream, <laughs> right? Prefrontal cortex says, you know, I'm going to get up and go work out at 7 o'clock. And next thing you know, it's really warm, cozy in bed, and you, you don't go. It's this, we're, we're all doing it. It's just not the disease of addiction unless the nucleus accumbens takes over. So now, what are the little things? What is the dopamine? They do this with dopamine by giving us these little rewards. So I want you to imagine like your favorite meal. Your favorite meal that you just have a great meal. Uh, how does that make you feel? It makes you feel good because you got a shot of dopamine that's about 50% more than normal. 
your dopamine level just went up. That's why you do it. Think about sex for a minute, okay? Sex is great. You know why it's great? Because dopamine goes in your brain encouraging you to do it. It's 200. I mean, it, it doubles the amount of dopamine in your brain. So here's what I'm suggesting. Everybody in this room, for the next year, go with, let, let's, let's all go on a diet and eat only salad and there's no sex for a year. No sex for a year. Who's in for that? No. We, we, want, we want the dopamine, right? We love the dopamine. Imagine what you just felt like trying to give that up for a year as opposed to somebody who has the amount of heroin or methamphetamine, um, it's, it's, it's five times harder than giving up sex. And none of us want to do that. So th th this is, uh, we know a little bit now about what's going on in the brain and what the problem is. But the, um, what, are, what are the solutions? And I guess I don't really know what all the solutions are, but there are some things that kind of inform the way that I uh, go about with my, work with my clients. And one of them, there's a fascinating series of experiments that were done with recovering addiction called the rat part. They were done in the 1970s, and you probably saw these first round of experiments. They would take a rat, and they would put a rat in a cage, and they would give it a choice between drug water and regular water. And a little rat in a cage will do the drug water until it dies. Proof, addiction, lock everybody up that has that. Another researcher came along and said, there's a flaw with this experiment. I work with rats. I know about rats. Rats are highly social creatures. They hate being in small cages by themselves, kind of like humans. Um, so he reworked the experiment. He created Rat Park. Same experiment, but lots of room. Not one rat, but many. Balls, tunnels, little amusement park for rats. And this time he gave them a choice between drug water and regular water. And guess what? The vast majority of rats never touched the drug water, didn't even use it, didn't want to use it. Only a small number of rats used the drug water, and none of them used it compulsively till they died. So with what they wanted to do is they wanted to have like little rat fun with their little rat buddies in Rat Park, okay? <laughs> they, they want what we want. We, they want comfort and connection and fun. So when you think about how it is that an addict, how do they engage their life? You have to create a life that's full of fun and engagement and, and joy. Um, and so, but this got me thinking about, I'm back to this slide again, I'm sorry. The, so the bad news of this 23 million, of this 23 million people, only 10% get treatment. And of the ones that get treatment, only about um, 40 to 50% of them stay sober a year later. I mean, it's 50, 50 to 60% relapse, and it's even higher for meth and heroin. It's the bane of treatment. Relapse is horrible. I have clients that go to relapse, they're doing great. They come back and a couple months later, they relapse. Like, what's going on? You know it, dude. You have every reason in the world to be sober. What's going on? So it got me very curious about relapse prevention. I, and I wanted to do something and really focus on what is it that we can do in the area of relapse prevention. The, the conventional wisdom is, hey, avoid your triggers. And if you think about, well, what's the reason for re relapse? There's a lot of reasons for relapse, but one of them is encountering triggers in your environment. So what can you do? Well, I'll, I'll tell you a story. I have a client. He's a very successful professional. He had an addiction to methamphetamine. He's been sober now for well over a year. He's doing really well. But he bought into this rat park theory, and we created a life that was just things he loved to do, rebuilding the connections and the fun. And, and you know the thing that he loved more than anything? He loved going to OU football games. I mean, there's nothing better than college campus in fall, putting on your crimson sweater and hanging out with like 100,000 members of your tribe. I mean, that's cool. The problem is that his trigger for use for meth was beer. Has anybody been on campus on a game day and had an urge to have a beer? Right? Right. This is dangerous territory. His rat park is dangerous. You can't avoid your triggers there. Because you, you know what? You can't get to this until you go through this and this. You know? Think about what if your advice is, man, engage in your life. What if you're, I want you to imagine with me for a minute, you're a recovering addict. And you're trying to create a fun and interesting life and you love sports, basketball, football. I don't know what it is, but chances are it's sponsored by a beer, a beer or a vodka. What if you're a, a live music person? Or you like music. Anybody ever been to a live music venue and seen drugs or alcohol there? Right? You know? I tell you what, just avoid your triggers, go home. Go home. I tell you, you turn on the television, 
even on social media. I mean, you're saturated with images of really attractive people suggesting, man, the good life is over here. What you need is a Heineken and a hangout with a captain, right? I mean, what about this dude, okay? I mean, who, <laughs> who doesn't want to be this guy, right? But I mean, for, I'm telling you, for, for millions of people with the disease of addiction, this is the beginning of a life of destruction. So, so what do you do? Really, avoiding your triggers isn't always possible. They're there. So I, I've got to think about how it is that we explore a way to help people suffering with addiction and, and avoid relapse. And maybe what we could do is engage that midbrain in some way. Engage the midbrain, but then retrain it. Get it to think about, instead of maybe avoiding your triggers, is there a way to encounter your triggers in real life? So um, I started looking at different disciplines um, and discovered a VA hospital that was treating burn patients with virtual reality so for a pain management tool. Virtual, you know, burn patients are, are in a lot of pain. They have this excruciatingly painful treatments daily where their, their skin feels hot and raw. And what they figured out is they can actually take a virtual reality and put a burn patient in it and have them simulate what it's like to walk through a winter landscape Literally, you, you feel like it looks like you're walking through snow. There's ice on the trees. You can see the snow falling. And all of a sudden, their pain level goes. It's a remarkably powerful tool, virtual reality. Um, right now, the emphasis has been on entertainment, but I think you're going to see a lot of therapeutic uses coming. I'm about to show you, this is my, this is my 16-year-old son, the first time ever he put on the VR. And he was watching a very short little animated horror clip. We have CGI or the... Or is it? It's CGI. But it's like a witch standing right in front of me. Oh my god! Oh my god! <laughs> right, right. So, that shows you a couple of things. One, just the power of virtual reality. It's, it, it can really just take the brain at its completely different place. But that's also the midbrain at work there. I mean, he knows, his prefrontal cortex knows where it is. He knows he's like got a piece of plastic on his head watching a little image. But it's a, it's, a, it's a very powerful tool. And now for the first time, what we can do is we can simulate what it's like for an addict to be in a, in a target-rich environment where they, have, where they have cravings and have them experience what it feels like to actually get a craving, what it's like that you'll experience like walking through Campus Corner holding a beer or going to a, a New Year's Eve celebration or, um, you know, sporting events. Sporting events. Uh, the, the, right now, um, with this technology that we're pairing with a, a kind of a mindfulness technique, a meditation technique called surfing the urge. So the conventional wisdom is distract yourself. This is different. It's focus on your urge. Experience it. Get comfortable being uncomfortable temporarily. Watch what goes on in the body, and you'll notice the urges come, and they go, and you're going to be okay. So anyway, we've started a... Um, a technology company to develop this technology. And right now we're building out a library of video simulations that simulate triggers uh, that we can reproduce in a therapeutic setting in a safe environment. And um, we really are optimistic this will be an effective tool for relapse prevention. Thank you.